All right, my voice is super raspy. We've had to relocate to my car, uh, <laughs> which actually has pretty damn good acoustics. And um, so this is the portion of the uh, the podcast and things like that where we talk about the sort of intersection and freewheeling ideas uh, that are associated with the intersection of music and philosophy. Um, this one is totally unscripted. I have no notes. No, and, I don't either. Well, we do and we don't. And I mean, what I really like about how this has evolved is that we use your blog as sort of a departure point. And one of the blog posts that I really, really enjoyed from last week that you came up with um, was that you were, and I think very profoundly examining what Kanye West is doing with the life of Pablo and how it is challenging our conceptions of what the album is. And I, and I don't want to steal your thunder anymore, so maybe you can articulate what you were talking about in that, in that sure. blog post. And I... There was an uh, article online from, I think it was New York Times, that touches upon this too. And we know from you know, Anthony Fantano from The Needle Drop talks about this idea too of Kanye West's album not really being a static thing, which is at once confounding and in another sense almost revelatory that I think especially from a popular music standpoint that Kanye West is acting in, that an album is a static product that somebody comes up with a record, they release it, and then that's that. But with Life of Pablo, what we're getting is something that is always being edited we're getting new versions of songs there are some versions of the album that have more songs than others you get the whole title streaming service that can only bring that but then only bring the album out apparently legally but then other people are bootlegging that version or different versions of the album mm -hmm. Kanye West has revealed different versions of songs. I think Wolves is one of them that has, I don't know how many editions. But what fascinated me is that it's it's almost more in the verb than the noun. Oh yeah, that's what you that, titled your 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 blog post, right? I don't think I I don't know if I or, or, I'm or, a verb. or yeah, it was, it's from this um, Ulysses S. Grant. What was the context for that quote? Well, um, well, Ulysses <clears throat> Grant was at the end of his life. He suffered from um, throat cancer, so he couldn't speak. So he he just wrote to mm. people. So I think this was actually a little written note to his doctor when he says, he says, "I think I am a verb rather than a personal pronoun." Something to that degree. We're just like, wow. That's pretty, yeah, it's we pretty are a intense. Process, where, yeah. where again, where again, it's like you know, you could say the same thing for Kanye West's album is that it's not so much a noun. I mean, maybe, maybe Kanye West is saying, you know, and maybe the album is saying, you know, I think I am a verb, not a personal pronoun, you know, where it's more about process. And granted, maybe other people would think that Kanye West would probably be more, you know self-absorbed and maybe he'd be like yeah man i'm all now and kanye west but i think the album at least this process in itself is very revelatory and is interesting and i i think it's cool to dwell on that I, idea of process I as being a product yeah. right i completely think it's interesting and that's why i wanted to talk about it and i think the thing is is like what are the philosophical points of interest to this you know from an aesthetic point of view from a from a perhaps a transmogrifying force in regards to <clears throat> social movements and how we think about art and what this means for our art communities and whatnot i think some of the major things to talk about are going to be um kind of what's the future of music right and i like I, I'm sort of of the view that the 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 rapid democratization of music recording, the streaming, the all of this has made as much as we like music and have more exposure to artists and music more than ever before. Uh, we don't really value their work. We don't properly compensate them, and we all have our hands in this. I mean, I. I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say the last time I bought an album, though I don't do illegal downloads. Uh, I sh like I, I just like when I play drums, like I just stream YouTube tracks, you know, which is made it frustrating because I really haven't heard much of Life of Pablo because it's not on YouTube yet. 
But um, so I think the question becomes is this the future? Is this going to be the thing where, where artists are just going to do constant sort of iterations of, of, of the album? And so you're going, you're going to have versions 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and all the way until you get to this point where you have an entirely new work that comes into being and it's no longer really connected to the original album. It's like the, in philosophy, there's this thing called like the ship of thesis. Hmm. Uh, I think, and, and it's, um, I actually might be butchering the Greek name. I'll have to look the Greek name up, but, um, the, the essential concept of it is, is this, there's a ship in the Harbor and, um, it is slowly t- taken apart one plank by plank. It's taken apart. It's moldy, rotten beams, one by one are taken apart and replaced with new ones. And, and then it's being gradually reconstructed in the port right next to it. Mm-hmm. Right. So at the end of this process, you have two boats and you have to ask yourself, which one is this ship? And at Mm. what point, okay, let's say you, maybe you say the one that's, that is consists entirely of the old parts is the original ship. It's been broken down. It's been reassembled at what point, because you would have a point where you were having two ships being built, right? And at what point does the one that's in port A become the, like the one that's in port B, right? You know, Cause they're both mm-hmm. are sort of in a process, but I think, I think the interesting point is, right. Is that you could have this thing where people just work on one album for the rest of their lives. Not unlike say like what Walt Whitman did with uh, leaves of grass. He wrote some other books that um, uh, revolve around leaves of grass, but you, mm-hmm. you, what's the, what's the backstory on leaves of grass? Well, leaves of grass, I think for me, is is a synony- maybe is a synonymous to what Kanye West is doing, or this idea that you can have multiple iterations, or maybe just in in literature and writing in general, is that you can have different editions of one text, and that an author can just add and add and add on a certain text for a long time, like Walt Whitman did. I mean. He released Leaves of Grass in 1855, and then he kept releasing editions until his death in like 1890, and, something like and that. We were, so looking, like, we were just looking at a copy of it. Right, once, and you we, had the first edition, I think, which only had 16 poems. I can't remember how many poems he added, but I think, it was, I mean, it was now about, or at least the last edition maybe was close to like a hundred, like 150, 200 pages, something like that. I can't remember what the exact number is, but he added a lot of poems. He edited some of the poems that were already in there, but Leaves of Grass was almost this kind of process, even when he was alive and that it was sort of became, it sort of became his personal project. I think it's amazing. Yeah. And then what could be really interesting, I, I don't, you know, personally... So there, there's good and bad to it. The, the, mm-hmm. the bad to it is that you could have a sense that like you could have artists who can't and artists are notorious for this. Anyway, the bad aspect of it is that artists won't be able to let go. They won't be able to let the work finally breathe and be its like thing and let it be critically received or whatever. And there's this Paul record, uh, recur quote that I really enjoy. He says that poems are never finished. They're only abandoned. Mm, and, and, yeah. and, and at some point as an artist, awesome. like I hate, like I, I have a hard time listening to my own music. Cause I'm just like, Oh, I hear nothing but imperfections. And I, I don't think I'm the only musician that's like that. Are you like that? Do you hear the problems in your music or do you, yeah, well, I know sure. Kirk I everybody, like everybody that. does, but I think, you know, like you said, it's just, a, you know, maybe some people are more prone to abandonment <laughs> than, than anything. Keep but, going with the lights. <laughs> but I, I, I think you're right. Yeah, I think some of you are like that. I well, I, I think what's but so, but what could be the um, <laughs> what could be what could be the problem with that? Right? Is well, we already mentioned the problem. What could be the good thing about it? Um, is that like you have this sort of 
that artists have this radical new way where they can control their content and make it valuable again. In the sense that like, if they're constantly doing iterations and updates and things of that nature, mm -hmm. then then like they can sort of seize some of the control back, you know, because our artists will work for like four or five years on a record, put it out there, have it get dispersed into the hive mind and then the nut and then the next big thing comes out or a news event happens and everybody's already moved on from the record so this way you can constantly sort of um make continue and make give people a reason to constantly check back on it to keep to be invested in and i was what i was saying to you earlier is i think this would be really wonderful to do to do to make a record in public from beginning to end from like the like like this right here like is the like where I'm like, hey CJ, what kind of record do you want to make? And we document every single aspect of it. And we're not talking about just like making like a music documentary. I'm talking about making like recording every aspect of it, like the whole process, the whole verb that it, are the people that's involved mm -hmm. in it, and how that could be super fascinating. Do you think some documentaries have done that? I mean, I think like I don't know. I can think of like Metallica's like they had that like some kind of monster, which I think showed at least the making of saint anger and how there's so much craziness going on that maybe i mean i i think i think people have done that before i don't i don't know if i don't know if it's the maybe it's completely cinema, uncharted it, it or means, maybe maybe it's not in the same way you're talking about cinema i suppose well even cinema works within constraints right it's still mm -hmm. working within like two hours of constraints we're sure. talking about just like the ultimate sort of reality oh, show. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but I don't know if an artifact, even when you go and you watch uh, a documentary like Wilco's, I'm trying to break your heart. Yeah. Or the, the, that documentary, which sure. is yeah, one of my showing, favorites. Like, yeah, yeah. Showing, I guess the Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, but like, yeah, but that kind of shows the making of an album too. I guess, yeah. Well, like what that. I'm talking about is no, the, the, the album is not hidden behind studio walls that, that, Oh, so there's not even an artifact to show of it. That no, it's just like the people movie. get to. It's like it's like when you go. It's like when you drive by a building mm -hmm. every day on your way to work that's being built from the ground up. It's not like it's behind a big veil, uh, it, like like or that a, a additions are made on or, or something like that. You are seeing the the, the foundation um, being dug, the bricks being laid, the windows ooh. being put in. You get to you get to experience its entire being maybe forever depending on when the artists abandon it or not you know what's really cool there was something like that happened recently i can't remember what if it happened this year or last year i heard about pj harvey actually um having this thing where she actually had she had a recording session and she had a a, a glass you know over like you know between her and an audience the audience could look in but she couldn't look out but they got to see her record this new that's album phenomenal. that she had. Yeah, where it's like, oh, that's really cool. Where it's yeah. like that. But I think that analogy, analogy to building is uh, to uh, you know construction is fascinating. And, I, and it was something I wanted to touch on because that ship of thesis kind of dilemma, I I think it really nails what we're talking about here. Because if you think of uh, a pro, you know, maybe of like an album, whether that be pop or experimental or whatever, we don't necessarily see the moldy ship getting, you know, taken apart. No, we all, all we see, all you know, like you said, maybe like the veil is covering that, and all we see is the new ship. Well, that's the or yeah, we always see it, but with what we're talking about, it's like we take that off, and you can see the old ship kind of. You see everything. Yeah, yeah you yeah. see everything, and then that almost kind of, I think, creates this sort of aesthetic, you know, existential crisis where it's like, what is the art art artifact then? What is life of Pablo? There, right? There, is is there isn't is there? one? No, there isn't one. And this is and this is the interesting thing, is that that all this the reason why that they, there's there's so much distance between in in the recording process and things going out there is that because people feel like they only have one shot to make that impression mm -hmm. right so they've got to like make this perfect product and they can't let things seep out or whatever because it'll like ruin the impression well okay no one cares no one cares about your perfect product anymore so might as well get ugly in public like do the thing like pj harvey did where she's like going to show like the process from beginning to end the the only problem is that with this is that 
you, you may have just like artists work on one album their entire lives, right? And I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the other thing is about this, and I, I want to talk, highlight some of the goods, is that part of the reason why those things are becoming, I think those things, those types of experiences, what Kanye West is doing, what PJ Harvey's doing, what I'm positing is like a band making something in the public space, um, maybe on the internet or something like that, is that lo in local music the scenes and things like that, I, like you do these, I don't know if you want, if you want people to know, but I'm just going to say it anyway, you do these, you organize these great um, little music lineups from people from the conservatory where they do, where they, each time they do like a unique concept, a unique arrangement, a unique rethinking of of music and it's it can't be replicated you can't get the mp3 of it you can't get the wave of it the and like i'm and i don't like i was saying to you earlier and this is not personal prejudice i would 10 times out of 10 rather come see one of the um performances out in winchester drive 40 minutes out way out of my way to see that than pay 30 dollars to see a band either replicate or um, disappoint my expectations for what their album could be at, at, at a major club in DC, mm -hmm. because I'm not interested in experiences that can be replicated anymore. I have too many replications. I have too many MP3s. Mm. I don't have enough things that are just going to blow my mind because I have no expectation and no categorization for them to begin with. And so when I come to your, when to your, um, your music nights, like it just, it's surprise after surprise. And it just, it, the aesthetic experience is one that is so much more gratifying than for me going to a pop concert or even just listening to the radio or something like that. Anymore. So what I get from that is that you're emphasizing this sense of, at least with what we're talking about, this new form or maybe this verb form is that it's not so much creating expectations, but not even having expectations, I suppose. There's, but it's, like, but there's it's no not, art. Yeah, there's no, no artifact. Right. There's no artifact to predetermine what the expectations are. But can there can there be expectate expectations at least with verbs as well? Like if you're going to play a ability, show, you're ability, going to okay ability. Like like I would say like you would expect like like. I mean, it's, I don't know if everything becomes jazz or fusion or whatever. Or I don't know what everything becomes. I, I think the expectation would be that when we put a premium on process that we're going, we don't know what we're going to get. We don't know what that, that concert's going to be like, what that musical experience is going to be like. But when we put a premium on that, we do expect our performers to still bring their A game and to present challenging ideas. Mm -hmm. And you know what's funny? It may get to the point where like the most challenging idea is for them to do a pop song to do something incredibly formulaic like oops we went and made a hit song because you were expecting us to i don't know do um uh i i don't i don't know a mariachi version of uh of of um of an elvis song you know but no we actually went and wrote a hit song like that would be like the most massive way to defy an expectation yeah because then that means that even when you do go out of bounds you can still kind of, like even still like going in bounds might be this radical kind of move you never know what's going to happen and maybe that's the way you can have both maybe that's the way that you can preserve the song in the typical format is that if no one knows what they're going to get when they show up they don't know if they're going to get like a conservatory experiment or if they're going to get a perfectly crafted pop song yeah. or maybe a blend or maybe nothing at all. Maybe it'll be a variation of John Cage's stuff, you know? Yeah, it might. It, maybe it, it's like... It's know, the mariachi me, remix of John Cage. <laughs> it's 433. I think, I think John Cage would like that. No, but I think it's it's a, an analogy I really like and maybe it's like kind of what we're alluding to is this idea of kind of staying at the edges of the box because you always hear the term like think outside the box but if you're outside the box nobody's gonna listen to you you're like off in la la land but i think like what we find fascinating is people projects art artworks that kind of still stay within 
conceptions that we know. Like, Life of Pablo is still within this... It's a, you know, the, the content of the music. It's still hip-hop. It's still something that... It's not, you know... Is really experimental. We're, I think we're not really so much talking about the content of the music itself, but we're talking more about, like I guess like we said, the way it's distributed, the way it's presented, the frame around it, that that, in a sense, is is how it's like on the edges of this box. It's still in the box in regards to the content, but in the way that content is presented, it's kind of moved itself towards the edges of the box. And that may be... I mean, I think what we're talking a lot about maybe isn't so much about trying to innovate music in the sense of like, I'm going to come up with this music idea that's crazy and nobody's ever heard of. At least I'm talking about content wise, you know what I mean? Where it's like mm -hmm. Elvis Mariachi Band or, you know, something like that. Where you're like, oh man, I'm just going to make this weird brick collage that nobody's ever heard before. But I think we're more talking about, at least what I'm interested in, maybe you are too, is about... um and maybe somebody that's listening is interested in what you can do with music frame wise and as a verb like oh okay what if i take this album and make it more of this kind of thing that's just going to go on forever that's never really finished or what if i take this what if i take the idea of a band or what if I take the idea of a concert and make it almost like a uh, ice cream truck that just goes different cities and maybe we get different people to come in, you know, where it's not so much like a venue, but it's just like, hey, it's just like this truck that goes along and people come up to the truck and listen to music. It's you know? like it's Where it's just like, it's like taking the thing like, I mean, it seems like we're not so much interested now in trying to, or no, I'm not going to even make that speculation where... At least I think what we're talking about, it's like we're not so much interested in um, trying to change the... I, I guess the analogy David Bowie made, which really is, is interesting, is he's not so much interested in trying to make new canoes. He's more interested in trying to change where the river goes. Change the way that maybe we view how music can be presented or how music can go one way or another. Is that maybe a good analogy or like kind of like what we're talking about in some way? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, that's what I'm saying is that, that all, I mean, I, I think, I think these revelations are ultimately changing, could change the direction of music where we go away from the pop format and that we go towards conceptual projects and we go towards unending projects and that this is evolution working itself out in music. That, that well, especially if we talk about it in it from a financial perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That this is these are going to these are going to have to be the things that artists do things like this in order to stay alive in 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 popular music. Um, at least, maybe not all artists. Maybe maybe there will be sort of this oligarchy, this one percent of artists, mm -hmm. the Beyonces, the Taylor Swifts. <clears throat> the Kanye West, even you could say, who can do whatever they want. And stay strict. But I mean, as as far as people who are struggling, mm -hmm. I, I I don't know. I think they have to radically rethink the river, the music, and rechannel it, build a dam, divert it, whatever. Um, I think that's kind of how it has to be. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, if if there's one thing I wanted to end on. Um... At least that, uh, that talks about this. Um, it's there's this great a little bit from this book called Reality Hunger by um, David Shields, and it's this little anecdote where he's talking about going to a gallery to look at some um, Rothko. I, be I believe it's Rothko. Look at some Rothkos. I might be getting this wrong, but to see this great artist's work and the the gallery uh, tour guy is kind of walking along and they're looking at the Rothkos and he kind of says, hey, does anybody know why Rothko was a great artist? They're like, what do you guys think? And they say all these things. Oh, it's the color. Oh, it's the lighting and how it works with the painting. And he's like, oh, those are all good points. But I think Rothko is a great artist because 
everybody after him or he changed the concept of art so that everybody after him had to view art differently he said like that to me or at least david shields you know listening to that he's like that to me that idea that this artist changed the way people think or changed the way other artists and other people think of how art is viewed is a measure of artistic greatness and i think if we're looking at life of pablo maybe we're we're viewing we're viewing it in that same way or Kanye West in that same way where maybe he, he's making us rethink how we view art itself yeah. that maybe we have to make these sort of shifts and we have to kind of I mean not get with it but we do have to kind of go with it and you know maybe form new things that shift other concepts of art as well and maybe that art is just this constant shift of ideas and then somebody takes that I that um that idea that was shifted and create something new out of that that maybe shifts the idea of something. Maybe it's just this constant idea of shifting, you know, sort of thing. Maybe that's just what we're kind of into right now. Well, what what I'd like to know, what I'd like to know is the intentionality behind what Kanye's doing. If he how how aware of how he is redefining the art form he is. Or if he's figuring it if he didn't if he didn't anticipate to do it like he's done it and that he's realizing in the process of the process that he's like, holy crap, like I'm actually reinventing what it means to make a record. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if he's, when he conceptualized Life of Pablo at the beginning of it, if he knew he was going to make, if it was going to be like this, or he just kind of surrendered himself to that process and it emerged that perhaps he has created a new way that we conceive of the record. Yeah, that's odd. Do you, I feel like maybe we both want it to be that it was just kind of just part of it. That, I don't think so. I think if organic, there's organic, but I think another part of us thinks like, oh no, he. Well, I think if there's any, that. I think if there's anything that you and I know is that as the result of collaborating, like when you know through the podcast, through music, and things like that, we figure things out as we go. Mm -hmm. You know.